Now here's the conundrum. Too many people are still unfamiliar with the fact that you have two diaphragms, not one diaphragm. So humans are asymmetrically put together. Our brains, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain are not the same. They don't function in the same way. And the right side and the left side of the body are not the same. The right diaphragm is bigger. You have more muscle over on the right side of your body. As I sit here, as you can tell by this chair, I like to sit on my right butt. That's normal. Left side's a little higher. Right side's been compressed over the years. That's normal. This is normal right dominance. So how does one establish the ability to diaphragmatically breathe? So this is going to be an exercise that you can use to practice diaphragmatic breathing with the emphasis on the left diaphragm. Now remember, because of right dominance, humans like to lie on their right side, or they like to lie on their back with their weight more shifted over to the right side like you see in this cadaver. Completely normal. The vast majority of people, when they lie down and they bend their knees, they will feel, or put their feet up on a wall, they'll feel their right side more in contact with the floor than the left. Sometimes they will feel the, feel the left, but it's because they're really, really overarched and it's kind of twisting them a little extra. So this position that you're going to get in, it's going to tilt your pelvis back by bending your knees and it's going to focus on bringing your rib cage down in front as you exhale. There's two places in the rib cage that really need to expand with air when people are stuck over on that right side. It is going to be the right upper chest and right lateral chest wall, but right now we're focusing on the right upper chest, needs to expand with air and the left lower and mid back needs to expand with air. This area gets tight because the left lower back likes to arch. As you arch that left lower back and stay over there or stay in that position because that's the position you'll be in if you're on your right side, these ribs in the back on the left can get tight. So they need to open with air. They need to push back into the floor as you breathe. Now, because the floor, you're going to be lying on the floor, because you're lying on the floor, you're not, your, your back is not going to expand too far backwards. That's not really the point. The point with this one is just to lie there, feel your left lower back staying flat, and sense the expansion of your rib cage up top, particularly on the right side. So I'm lying on my back. I'm sensing my left heel and arch of the right foot. I'm going to pick my butt up just slightly, and then I'm just going to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. In through my nose, I breathe out. I try to exhale all of my air because we need these ribs to come down in front. And that's what you're going to see. Now I'm already expanded. So you're not going to see a ton of movement in my rib cage. But I take a breath in, my rib cage expands, it rises, and then I as exhale, all the air gets forced out. Exhale through my mouth, and I repeat the process. So that's all I'm doing. In through the nose, out through the mouth. I want to keep sensing my left heel, keep sensing my right arch, because those, are, those areas are associated with going over to your left side, or at least not being on your right side. Uh, and you want to then keep your left lower back sensed, left lower and mid back sensed, staying flat on the floor as you breathe. You'd inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. Some people need to open their mouth more to help get that air out. Sometimes their lips are still too closed. Get all the air out. Feel your ribs coming down. Pause for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Take a breath in through your nose. So you could do this for about four sets. Uh, five breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth. Pause for five seconds before the next inhale. You're trying to slow everything down. Uh, you could do four sets of five breaths. You could put it any time into any workout routine, PRI routine, whatever you're going to do. It's, or it's just a breathing practice. During this exercise, when you posturally tilt your pelvis by picking your butt up off the floor a little bit and you're sensing your left heel and right arch, if you feel cramping in your left hamstring or you feel cramping somewhere in your, in your hamstrings on either leg, but generally people will feel it more in the left hamstring, it's because you're not getting all your air out. You're not diaphragmatically breathing at that point. Now, why might someone not feel expansion? Why might they cramp? Why might they struggle to get air out? Why might they not be able to do this? Well, it's going to come back to the neck and you'll have to continue watching the video to understand the neck's influence on this type of uh, exercise. So one other thing, there's a pause at the end of each exhalation. So when you're doing this technique, you inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, and you pause for five seconds before you inhale again. 
Now, why do you pause at the end of exhalation? Well, here's a, uh, a study. Inclusion of a rest period in diaphragmatic breathing increases high frequency heart rate variability, meaning when you put an, a pause at the end of the exhale, your heart rate variability increases. They get better. Heart rate variability is a general marker of health. You want high heart rate variability. Uh, it is obviously heart rate plus breathing and how those interact. That, that is the vagus nerve. That is the vagus system. That's your brain stem. That's, that's all the lower areas of the brain. That's your autonomic nervous system. So when you have a higher heart rate variability, that's a general sign of better health. So many people have overactivity of their anterior neck, the SCMs and the scalenes that are pulling the rib cage up. So even a techni technique like this may not work completely if that brain is not letting go of the neck. The neck has to let go for this process to occur. To, so to reaccess your diaphragms for nervous system uh, regulation, for autonomic nervous system regulation, you cannot be neck breathing. That's well understood. Now also, because remember this is a lot, all this autonomic nervous system activity is um, vagus nerve activity, the ventral vagal system, anything in the ventral vagal system, teeth, jaw, tongue, vision, voice, uh, speech, swallowing, any of those types of issues which create neck overactivity, that can be a reason why your neck might not let go and you might not be able to get into this position comfortably and to actually diaphragmatically breathe at that point. That is an unbelievably, con that's really, everything in posture restoration, remember, definitely comes back to up here. When people are breathing in this extended position, using their neck and their lower back to breathe, you'll often see a bilateral rib flare, just like this gentleman. Uh, it is just an indication that their rib cage is elevated, the ribs come forward and up, uh, and their back is going to be tight, their neck is going to be tight, and their pelvis is usually going to be flipped forward on one or both sides. Okay, so you're going to see this individual uh, breathe through extension. He takes a breath in, he arches his back, and his shoulders rise up. Pause, now I'm going to focus five, in. Four, I'm going to have him pausing, and we'll talk about why he's pausing. Two, one, breathe in. He breathes in, and there it is. He's arching his back, and his shoulders will start to rise at the end. And that is all neck and lower back breathing, and that's what we want to stop. Otherwise, he will never be able to okay. get out of his extended posture. Now, this is the same individual with the bilateral rib flare. You can see when, in the beginning of the session, this was his second session, uh, when he was stand, when I had him stand on his left leg, his still, you can see his ribs are still elevated, pushed out, and are kind of being pushed to his right side. So he's trying to stand on his left. His left shoulder is lower than his right, interestingly, but he's overarched. So he's not really in left stance. If I laid him down at that point, he would not test neutral. So don't let it look, you know, it might look like he's over his left leg, standing on his left leg with his left shoulder lower, which of course is what we're trying to get to have people do in PRI. But he's so extended that his rib cage is staying, so here's my left, he puts himself over his left, but his rib cage is staying so extended and over to the right that he never really achieved true left stance. The second picture, he's in a much better position. He needs to work on his left glute medius because he, in the, actually in the first picture, he felt like he was falling over to the left. In the second picture, it was at the end of the session, uh, and we did more than just breathe, but I did start him with a very similar uh, technique that you're going to see. Uh, by, the, by the end of the second session, he was able to, to pretty comfortably stand in left stance, so 80% of his weight is back through his left foot. Uh, I still want to get his head over his left side, but I didn't direct him. He just, that's where he stood, okay? So that was a big change. And he just needs to stabilize his left hip more with his left glute medius, which again is a huge part of any PRI programming.